This is Based in Fact, a true crime podcast. Join host Lisa O'Brien as she examines America's most infamous true crime cases through the lens of the court, not the court of public opinion. No spin, no theories, no rumors, just facts. Here's Lisa O'Brien. In episode three, I'm joined by guest host Kyle, and we're talking to Patrick and Becca about the myths and lies surrounding the Rodney Reed case and the coverage of it by the media. The primary source of those myths and lies is David Fisher, a self-proclaimed consultant who claims to know the law, but demonstrates with every word that he hasn't got a clue. After listening to his appearance on the January 31st, 2022 episode of Kevin Stew's podcast, I realized that the myths and false information in that episode alone could fill an entire show. So that will be the topic that we tackle in this episode. Before we begin, I do want to tip my hat to Patrick, who was the mystery caller on Kevin Stew's show last week. Patrick, you made a lot of great points, including pointing out Fisher's habit of bringing in unrelated cases and complaints that aren't relevant to Rodney Reed's case. You also demonstrated how little either Stu or Fisher cares about factually accurate information. And I say, bravo, sir. All right. Hello, everyone. Hello, good afternoon. And we're going to get, get right, right started. Uh, before we went on record, uh, we had a, oh, we have Tim Sparkman. That was Tim Sparkman. That was our mystery caller who wouldn't identify himself. Um, he must have been having technical difficulties and he'll be joining us hopefully in a few minutes. So um, let's talk first. Uh, why don't Patrick and Becca, why don't you each introduce yourself starting with uh becca hi i'm becca and i knew stacy uh, back in high school um we were really good friends and um i have determined myself to become a voice for stacy in this time when she doesn't have one great and we appreciate you being here Thank you. I appreciate you inviting me. This is really nice to get to discuss something that's near and dear to my heart. All right, Patrick. Yeah. Um, so I'm uh, not a lawyer. I'm not really a true crime fanatic. I didn't know Stacy or the family or, or um, uh, much about Bastrop. I'm not a cr- crusader for justice really in any way in my regular life, but I became interested in this specific true crime and justice crusade and legal case um, about two or three years ago. Um, I'd say my interest was drawn by the same thing others have seen in the case. A woman's murdered, a man's accused, and on the surface of all, there's like this thin layer of doubt that involves uh, the, um, the fiance and the police. And my first thoughts were, you know, it's so sad that this poor woman was murdered by someone she loved, her fiance. And um, there were along the lines, you know, I, 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 I didn't dive deep into it at first, but there were, there were some things that just uh, tripped me up when I, when I heard, heard the story. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm relating to, you know, what if Stacy was my wife or my, my mother or something in it. So I started really saying what a tragic case this was. And the more I found uh, people uh, adamant about uh, Rodney being innocent, and Jimmy being guilty, the more I found that the rationale that people got there really stretches the lines of incredulity. It's just like people are are willing to turn themselves into a pretzel um, to to, to blame uh, Jimmy or, you know, basically to exonerate Rodney. And I think that it goes with the press too, because it's not just the uh, you know the, the the innocence project and um, Rodney's supporters. It seems like every press article, like during during the um, uh, summertime, 
they they have the spin of you know maybe this innocent man might be able to get out of prison and uh so that frustrates me a lot and so i dive i dove even deeper um into it and uh certainly uh the the um the website that uh uh of lisa's uh your your website with uh, all of the transcripts let me spend you know a couple of weekends two two winters ago just uh, reading through it all. And it was just uh, as plain as plain could be that this is a case where people are trying to manipulate the truth in the, in the press. And, but the, but the, the but the, 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 the courtroom uh, case and the appeals speak for themselves. And so that got me more agitated and it gets me going. I don't, I'm not like this in any other case, but um, you know, I, I hope to see uh, Stacy you know, receive the justice that she deserves. Amen. Yes, absolutely. And Tim, thank you for joining us. I am so sorry. I did not recognize the phone number. That's okay. I was wondering if y'all can even hear me. No, we could not hear you. I, I, I sent you a message in chat and you didn't respond. And I thought, how the oh. heck did somebody get in here? No, no, and no. It was... <laughs> stuff and I sent you a message back and so on so good luck. Oh, I, it didn't show up here and I'm I'll focused focus. on zoom because we had technical issues last week when I tried doing two screens at once so yeah. I'm trying not to dump us and have to start all over again well and and I have to apologize because it took me a good 20 minutes to figure out zoom <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, well, do you want to give us a, a, a quick um, introduction of yourself and then we'll, we'll get on with the, with the topic for today's episode. Sure, how many folks are online with us? Well, we're actually recording this and it's just us. Yeah, that's fine. The, uh, so how many people are recording with us? <laughs> We've got Patrick and Kyle, who is uh, the honorary guest co-host today and becca a friend of stacy's nice well my name is tim sparkman i am uh from bastrop i was in local law enforcement from about 99 till current i'm still in law enforcement here in the area um i would wouldn't call myself an expert on the case but i'm pretty dang close but right. um in the criminal investigation division for, I don't know, since 05 at the Bastrop County Sheriff's Office. I was in the patrol area before that. And then I moved into a specialized unit in narcotics and stuff. And now I am uh, serving as the current constable of Precinct 3 as an elected official. But the, uh, uh, the Stites case has always been really interesting to me because my father was a supervisor at the sheriff's office around the time this all took place and i knew all about it you know and then of course being in the investigative division and stuff and it's always been a i don't know a cloud looming over the investigative division and just listening to you guys talk about how the news is spun stuff differently and every time i hear something in the news I just cringe going, where are they getting this information? Mm -hmm. Then I have to tell myself, if this was just the case, and I don't want to minimize it at all, of Stacy got murdered by Rodney Reed, and there was no scandal involved, then that would not even make the news. We would have been done a long time ago. But then you have to throw in a little, oh, well, I, I heard on the street and the rumors that started flying. And you know how you tell one story to one person and next thing you know 50 people know a version of the same story but none of it's even remotely close mm -hmm. that's kind of that's kind of what snowballed here and everybody's kind of jumped in and and given their two cents worth and i've got close personal friends that are just adamant that rodney reed is innocent and mm -hmm. I, I talk to them about 10 to 20 minutes and they're like man what why do why do i not know that information why does that why is why are they not talking about that and until yeah i guess it was november 20th 2019 his mm -hmm. last day 
and it sounds like the uh, the Stites family has just thrown the gloves off and said, "All right, let's get it on." And and before that, everybody was kind of being quiet quiet about it from the prosecution side, right? And they were just saying, "Hey, if you want to know about it, read the transcript and stuff." And then when it when it started being tried in the uh, you know the land court of pu- public the court yeah. of public opinion, uh, yeah. When yeah. when it did, that's when everybody who especially law enforcement wise started talking started saying hey if if that's how you feel let let me show you what really was said in that courtroom and stuff and now we got podcasts and we got video we got all kinds of stuff going on and there's a bunch of people that are jumping off that reed bandwagon i I believe there's some people that are still on it and and you couldn't push them off with a you know with a broom but that they're going to jump off when when they start hearing more and more stuff yeah, and, you know, and Lisa, I think that's one of the things that's so dangerous about cases like this is we already live in a very divided world, especially around sort of racial issues. And I think it's really dangerous when we have such a largely misinformed population that just sees snippets on social media. And these types of cases can really be divisive because people read into a racial narrative that's just not present. And I think just for I think it's a really public service you're doing, just helping people understand that this case is not, there's no some sort of, you know, racial, rach, excuse me, racial witch hunt in this case, that this is a man that committed a horrible murder and people should know the truth. Right. And prior to this horrible murder, he committed several very violent sexual assaults within a couple of years of this murder and six months after this murder he committed an attempted assault and stole a vehicle that was found in the parking lot where stacy's truck was found which is what led to him 11 months later being arrested for stacy's murder and one of the biggest problems that i see with the media i watched the people magazine story today context they take things out of context and they compress events and they include events together that happened months apart so that's what i i like to address and i've seen each of y'all address it as well so that's where we're gonna that's where we're gonna that's what we're gonna do with david fisher's specifically if I could say something, Lisa, it's, it, you know, it, it, I, I wonder why there's no um, either local news channel or, you know, national coverage of this that kind of goes hard against the fact that there is solid, solid evidence against um, uh, Rodney Reed. And I guess the thing is that, you know, reporters, you know, they don't like to just report the news. They like to influence the news. And the idea of saying that uh, someone who is found guilty is guilty doesn't get people to read their magazine article or their uh, listen to their newscast. But saying that someone who has found, been found guilty is secretly uh, innocent and, and is persecuted for 20 years and it is racism, that is going to get a better headline. But well, it is so right. frustrating because I... if there was somebody who, who documented this very well in a public way, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think that it would take all the air out of the innocence. Project. And I would actually recommend KVUE did a podcast, a multi-part podcast yeah. in, I believe it was November of 2019. Yeah. And it actually was more slanted toward the guilty side. I think they brought in some of the defense allegations but they did not present them as proven true which podcast was that kvue crime uh i'll have to um i'll post a link on the discussion page on rodney reed discussion page on facebook because anybody who hasn't listened to it i would highly recommend that they listen to it yeah Yeah. i believe that's an austin tv station right correct it is is. i would be interested and I Go found ahead. during the during the hearing in July, KVUE's coverage was more neutral than some of the other. It's called crime stations. files. Crime uh, files, exactly. 
But I think Patrick's right. If you say this person who was convicted actually did it, that's not going to get eyeballs and attention. But if you can especially sort of sow racial division with, uh, you know, another, you know, innocent black man was railroaded Mm -hmm. by a conspiracy of evil Texas law enforcement, that's what, you know, gets Twitter ablaze and that what gets attention. And I think that's a lot of this behind that. And, Mm -hmm. you know, helps the Innocent Project raise money and get attention and stay in the news. And speaking of which, uh, Tim, you had an encounter with uh, Innocence Project's Titus Levy, who is an investigator. Yeah. Um, And why don't you tell us about that? Because I know I've talked to other people who have actually had investigators say, we have evidence that proves him innocent, but we need your help. Yeah, I think they were, they were kind of just, it was right before, let's see, trying to think of, it was last summer, but just one evening, he, he showed up at my house and, you know, caught my wife at the, and my house is way back in the woods, you can't even see it, it's 3,000 feet from the road and stuff like that, but, which, it's no big deal, but you know, that, that was pretty brave of somebody to just come down a driveway like that and ask, Hey, does Tim Sparkman live here? Especially in the line of work that I've been in the last 20 years. But, uh, uh, he was very kind, very polite, very inquisitive. And he was real standoffish when I said, well, who do you work for? Do you work for the innocence project? Well, no, not really. I'm, I'm an independent investigator and we're just kind of wanting to interview, uh, law enforcement personnel that were around in the in in and around the time of the the trial and the murder and stuff like that and i told him i said well i came in right after but i was you know i lived here and my father was in law enforcement back then i knew about it and all that kind of stuff but i think what they were searching for is disgruntled law enforcement that would possibly throw a wrench into something and and about 10 minutes into our conversation i think he realized that that's that wasn't the stance that I had. And, and, and he was, he was real polite real, and, and listened to what I had to say and stuff like that. I mean, my, my wife made mention, she said, you know, he had a notepad and a pen and stuff, but he never wrote anything down. It, it's almost like once he realized he was in the wrong place, he couldn't get out of here fast enough. Mm-hmm. But, but while I had him here, I, I, I asked him some stuff. And, and of course I'm, I'm of the, the belief that the uh, the innocence project is doing some good work and 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 there there is a need for them and stuff the michael morton case just for example but um, and i told him i said but i believe y'all are wasting valuable money resources and everything on this read case because if you step back and look at it there's this is this guy's got a better chance of winning the Powerball lottery twice in a row than he does being not guilty of this crime. And then, of course, he asked, well, how, how would you explain that? And, not, and I went in and ex- started explaining some stuff to him. And I'm sure he knew everything I was talking about, but did not know how to combat that because there is no explanation for your semen being inside of a 12-year-old. I don't mm-hmm. care how you shake it. You can get on national TV and say, Rodney's no choir boy, but that doesn't change. If you look into the choir boy, uh, I'm sure that uh, a lot of people would understand what I'm talking about. But uh, he, he did, uh, he, he asked a few questions and stuff. And, and, uh, and, I, and when I had viable answers and explanations that, that made you go, hmm, I guess you're, you look at it that way makes perfect sense and but but it was odd that he that he, that he came here and and, and a, another friend of mine had a run in with uh, david fisher and I, I told you about it to him uh, saying that uh, the of course the bottom of the case is fixing to fall out because of a, a possible um dying you know confession from curtis davis mm-hmm. you know and <laughs> But I don't know where that came from. And I, I knew I knew Curtis really well. He was a close personal friend of mine. And and, and Curtis was nothing but honest and forthright. Yeah. 
Oh, definitely. No, and that is, and that's never materialized. No. Yet another prediction that doesn't materialize made by it, David Fisher. If it had, that would be on the front page of the paper be everywhere. But I was like, I don't know where that's coming from, but that well, it might. And that's, somebody. you know, it, it, that's the thing. If David Fisher has brought the Innocence Project a witness prior to these July hearings with a deathbed confession from Curtis Davis of having brought Jimmy Fennell from Bastrop to Giddings yeah. on the night of or the early morning hours of April 23rd. And yeah, the Innocence Project did not use that or attempt to use it yeah. or attempt to have another writ. That tells you something. That means the Innocence Project does not find David Fisher to be a reliable, credible source and that's of information good. unless it deals with potential Brady violations. Yeah, and it sounded they like on the used podcast. For that. It sounds like on the podcast when he was talking previously, the one we've referred, sounds like he's gotten crossways with the Innocence Project because I know he was saying quite a few negative things about the Innocence Project. So yeah, it does make sense that they've somehow gotten crossways with one another and they've probably found him to be a little bit of a kook too and which is probably why he seems to be attacking the Innocence Project and as well. That is now why he's attacking the Innocence Project. Exactly, Kyle. That is why he's attacking them because they don't take him seriously. Well, and... You know, he's totally, he's, again, it, it, he doesn't know what he's talking about, about the Innocent Project or attorneys or how they work. He thinks he does, but he really honestly doesn't, speaking as someone who's been in litigation and civil yeah. law for over 30 years. Well, I think David Fisher's can be summed up in his comments that we should not necessarily pay any attention to the court records or anything that occurred within the confines of the legal system. But what you should instead pay attention to is all of these secret sources that he has that no one else has. That's really what matters. But what actually occurred under oath or in a deposition or part of the appeals process that should be disregarded. You know, forget the court record and the transcripts. That's a waste of time. But listen to me because I have a conspiracy theory to peddle you. Correct. Yeah, let's ignore cross-examination evidence, but let's uh, put all our weight onto hearsay and rumors. Right. And his speculation about what motivated Lisa Tanner or Rocky Wardlow or David Board or John Barton or David Campos or you know, any of these other people, um, his myth about the bags of clothing in the dumpster being the yeah. same bags that were observed by Paul Alexander in the truck. Yeah. And I think to underscore, Lisa, I think a good point that you make constantly, as well as some of your, you know, colleagues is it's one thing to tell a news station or to say something to somebody it's an entirely different ball of wax to be under oath and to say that under oath and to face cross-examination. And that goes for a lot of these cases, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of these big public cases from, from Adnan Syed to Stephen Avery to Dar all of them have some secret witness that claims that they know the truth, but yet whenever those witness, whenever they want to go on the record or under oath or face cross-examination, their stories either change or they refuse. That's a constant theme in a lot of these cases. Correct. And look at Arthur Snow. Arthur Snow appeared. He gave his direct testimony. And then as soon as the state started cross-examining him, he started pleading the fifth and got very belligerent and didn't want to testify anymore. And cool. when the judge said, well, if you're not going to if you're not going to testify during cross-examination, I'm striking your testimony. The Innocence Project had to take him back and talk him off a ledge. An interesting thing too is if you uh, if if you look at the Innocence Project, uh, if you look at their website, they have all sorts of um, brochures and slicks that talk about uh, jailhouse snitches and how they should not go towards. Of course, in their case, you know, saying someone's guilty of something, but yet 
their process, their, their, their whole defense of Rodney this past summer was bringing out uh, jailhouse snitch after jailhouse snitch. Right. Because if it's a, a confession by your alternate suspect, then jailhouse snitches have no bone, no skin in the game. They have no reason to lie. They're absolutely telling the truth. And even if they've been convicted of a hundred counts of forgery, which is a crime of dishonesty, they're entirely credible and they're more credible than a witness who has never been convicted of a crime of dishonesty or your alternate suspect who testifies, I didn't do it. Yeah, that is so true. That's another theme you see running through all of these cases and especially the Reed one is you see these just complete double standards of, yes, that's a great example. The jailhouse snitch is great if it's supporting their case, but must be constantly, you know, ignored in all other cases where the guilt is, where the guilty party was convicted. Yeah, those double standards are one of the things that frustrates me to no end. And the unadjudicated offenses are also another part of the double standard. You can't trust the unadjudicated offenses of Reed to say exactly. he so raped true. and murdered Stacy, but because Fennell was convicted of a single crime involving a rape years later years later all the accusations and allegations of women who came forward during that investigation even though they weren't pursued or prosecuted you can believe him and he's a serial rapist yeah so true and yet That's he's only got one. the one conviction and you know i would argue rodney reed has a conviction for raping and murdering stacy stites If that's the, the bar, he has sure. met the bar. We can take those unadjudicated offenses and say he is a serial rapist. Well, and then in the Reed case, whenever people say, well, he, he was never convicted of anything and that you can't even bring that up. And I'm like, they, they did bring that up and they compiled them all during the uh, punishment phase. Mm -hmm. And and oh, there really? are there are open indictments and the innocence project has done nothing in 20 some odd years to have any of those open indictments dismissed no nor have no. they done anything in 20 years to take any of them to trial well and they're saying that this whole case is based only on the dna and i'm like well that's well someone but, but the thing is, it's based on the DNA and the fact that there is absolutely no other evidence. Mm -hmm. Explain. And, and they misrepresent the DNA. They say it's a few sperm cells when in fact it was um, intact sperm cells and saliva on Stacy's breast. Well, and, and meant, you just know, real, I, real, real quickly, just to put everything in context there, Stacy's routine was that she would get up early in the morning. And she would get in the truck and she would drive to Bastrop for a very early morning shift for which she earned an extra, was it 50 cents or dollar an hour? Yeah, Stacking like stocking that. protos. Yeah. Um, now, one of the things Reed has claimed is that the, the last time he saw her was before she went to work. But her routine, there was no time before she went to work for her to go hang out with Reed and have sex with him because she was leaving just in time to get to work. And she was a, 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 a reliable employee who was never late for work. Multiple employees, as well as a manager testified, she was always on time. And correct me if I'm wrong, it, the, the timeline started a couple days before she was murdered. And then it has, it has, moved down to a few he's, hours he's he said um he said at one time well of course he said he didn't know her never yeah. saw her in heb never talked to her never knew her didn't wasn't dating her and then after he found out about the dna he was oh yeah that's right we were having a secret relationship because i'm black and she's white and this town is racist yeah um even though he always dated white women and he never hit it he had children with white women and did not hide it and was not framed for their murders so those a, things are kind of I they don't make that, sense of course i don't have it written in front of me but i'm sure 
when when he said, oh, yeah, we were having a, a sexual relationship clandestine type. So when was the last time you saw her? And he said it was a couple days before. And then he said, oh, no, no, no. In 2014, he remembered yeah. it was April 21st, late at night or April 22nd, early in the morning. And the problem I have with that is let's just play devil's advocate here. Say that's true. You mean to tell me Stacy went home and slept next to her fiance that she was working these extra shifts for and didn't shower and well, didn't clean up? I mean, that to me it, right there is it's just- not only that, but it's that she went to work without having showered. Mm-hmm. She stayed at her mom's house that afternoon without bathing or showering or changing her underwear. She did change her clothes because she took her H-E-B uniform off. Um, And then she hung around with her fiance that evening after he got back from baseball. And then supposedly took a shower with him. And well, but, but he's a liar and he's the real killer. So we can't believe anything he says, even though Rodney reads a convicted murderer, but every word he says is gospel. God's honest truth. Um, But another thing (laughs) that I pointed out in, in, um, in this when, as we're talking about the, the semen and the DNA and the saliva on her neck and chest area is, uh, I believe it's Blakely in her, in her field notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw it on one of the, uh, one of the documents that we had before where uh, she is the DPS crime lab person in charge of the crime scene when, when Stacy's body was found mm-hmm. and in, in the, in her notes, it says that she has had sexual sex with somebody recently. And due to the, the fact, the amount of semen that was still inside of her, she had not stood up. There was, I think her exact words were, there was very little movement of Stacy Stikes after the semen was secreted inside of her. Correct. And we'll also drink. the crotch on her panties was wet. Yes which means that that was not day old semen leaking out. And and that is exactly what I have told uh, some of my personal contacts that when they ask me, well, what about this? What about that? And I'm like, if you'll start here and then move out, you're Mm -hmm. not going to explain it any other way. Yeah. And when you look at the facts of the case, the, the truck was found in a location that was convenient for Reed, not, not Jimmy Finnell. Oh, and yeah. David Fisher's claim of a witness seeing Rocky Wardlow and Ed Summell and Jimmy Finnell and, and David Board in a parking lot at the high school around the truck, that witness did not come forward to police at the time of the murder, didn't come forward to Reed's defense at the time of trial. Um, As I recall, it's actually a Reed cousin, and the only person she's ever told this story to is on Ryan Polomsky's documentary and David Fisher. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I think that's a good point, too. I mean, on the whole Fennell conspiracy angle, he, he goes, I mean, he certainly, let's just assume he did it. He sure takes a lot of risk. There would have been much easier, smarter ways to do it than risk driving, you know, what was it, you know, a round trip, you know, Mm -hmm. all that way. It just doesn't pass the common sense test. I mean, you know, what are the odds, you know, it's early in the morning, you get pulled over for a ticket. There's so many things that anybody with basic common sense, especially somebody that was in law enforcement, would have enough sense to say, yeah, I, I don't want to be on the highway because yes, I'm going to drive the speed limit, but there's always a risk that, you know, you get pulled over and it's just, it just doesn't make, it just doesn't right. pass the basic common sense test. And there's also the fact, if you had an unwitting accomplice, say Jimmy had called Tim that night and said, dude, I'm over in batch, my, my truck broke down. I'm at the high school. Can you come pick me up? Tim would have said, sure, bud, I'll come pick you up. Gets there, picks him up. The next day, day after that, he hears Stacy's been murdered. He hears the trucks found at the parking lot at the high school. He hears her body's found in Bastrop. 
What do you think Tim's going to do? Tim's going to go to police and say, hey, he called me and had me come pick him up. I had no idea what was going on. Right. Curtis Davis in his interview with CNN said, if Jimmy Finnell had called me and said something happened, Stacy's dead, you got to help me cover it up, I would have arrested him. And that's exactly true. Yeah. He would have and and Fisher, makes, if Fisher the makes the crazy claim that he dropped, you know, what did he say? He dropped him off by the side of the road and then Fennell walked up, you know, walked the last quarter mile to the apartment because it was, you know, he didn't want to be seen. It just, it's, Correct. it's just silliness. And, but he would have been heard going up the damn stairs and right. he would have had to make at least two trips between, because Stacy was a tall girl um and Fennell's not particularly big guy and that's another thing the position of the seat neither Fennell nor Stacy could have driven the truck and two why why would they put the truck at the high school if they're trying to frame Reed why wouldn't they park it right behind the house and why would they wait and not question him on April 23rd or April 24th why would they wait until April 4th 1997 to even question him about stacy right. if the plan from the go or from the jump was to frame him yeah exactly. why, why, yeah off a of blue bonnet by circle yeah. d why don't you just leave it and, in the truck and Drive. tim um you can correct me if i'm wrong but you're in law enforcement is the last per place a person seen a probable cause for a search warrant not necessarily because in my, in my reading of Fourth Amendment law, not necessarily. There has to be something else that connects the crime. And in this case, Giddings is in Lee County. So they would have had to go to Lee County to get a search warrant. Yeah. And, and let me, I'll, I'll visit on that real quick. The, the, I've heard this a, a different time. B is, is law enforcement and B, I, and I, I consider myself a, a, a Fourth Amendment you know, kind of specialist. I wrote, you know, hundreds of search warrants and narcotics wise and everything like that, even for homicide stuff. But uh, the fact that Jimmy's apartment was not searched to me is, is very minor. I know that they have blown it up and, and even, uh, even the investigators now looking back, they're like, well, sure. I wish we would have done that. And I mean, we can armchair quarterback it to death, but at the time, Jimmy was just, uh, he, he wasn't a suspect because they hadn't even found Stacy's body. They just all went, some, a few, few guys went back to Jimmy's apartment with him. And they were looking around, Curtis Davis including, looking around, there's like nothing in the house. Now, if they would have seen a coffee table that was broken with a leg missing or, a, a, you know, maybe, maybe uh, some holes in the sheetrock that were freshly made or, you know, some, something that looked like maybe this, there had been a disturbance there or something like that. But even, you know, when Curtis was there, he was like, I, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. We, you know, we were talking with Jimmy and he's like, man, can you think of any place she would have gone and stuff? But then of course she was found later that afternoon. Then it became a homicide investigation. If when they all went out there, but then they were like, well, we were just at Jimmy's house. There wasn't really anything over there. Now it's come Later on down the, 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 the line, 20 years later, you got some conspiracy theories that that uh, Stacy was murdered in the apartment and she was drowned because of the amount of fluid that was found in her lungs or something like that. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I would have put a whole lot more. Uh, I, I think I would have trusted that investigator slash professional guy. I don't remember his name. He, he's the one that got on. Uh, on tv and he's got his own show now or something kevin he's gannon like, yeah she she had to have been drowned because of the amount of fluid that was in her lungs and stuff like that and i'm like man that's a that is a investigator 101 easy explanation i, I can't believe that guy he got i, on, I, got I personally floor. i personally because i've heard all this from david fisher uh initially in initial interviews that I, I saw or heard of his. So I believe that Kevin Gannon was A&E's way of trying to legitimize David Fisher's theories. 
Nice. He earned his money because he works really hard to make no sense whatsoever. Because um, the, the, the amount of fluid in her lungs actually was normal. Correct. But they, and but they strangulation, throw it, out. it has nowhere to go. It ends up going in the lungs. Yeah. It was a normal amount. But the, he, you know, on his, in his A&E, he just says this, I forget what the exact amount of ounces of, of, of uh, fluid is. This is abnormal. But if you uh -huh. actually, which I did, I looked it up. And it's actually yeah. well within the, the bounds of normality of, of uh, someone who's passed away. And that's another problem that I have with Fisher because he's he's holds himself out as a master of medicine and law and, uh, you know, search and seizure. And he's really not even a jack of all trades. Yeah. Um, he's not a medical doctor. He has no medical training. And yet he is saying Stacy was cooked. Stacy was blue. Stacy was this and that based on his interpretation of photographs. And then extrapolating all these, all these theories about time of death and, and place of death and body position after death, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, and then they've gone and gotten medical examiners who legitimize that, but they have to look at only a very small set well, of, of data. I, I will, I will tell, I'll tell you one, one, one thing. I have been to several hundred autopsies. I mean, over the years that for some reason, I was the one that always had to go to the, to the autopsies for some reason, just, Deceased person, no matter what, it doesn't matter if it was a homicide, suicide, natural, whatever. We attended autopsies and I attended several autopsies with Dr. Biden. I, not Biden, it's uh, Bayardo. Bayardo. Uh -huh. and, uh, and when they say, you know, this uh, time of death stuff, it, it, it's kind of, it's not exact science and stuff. The first thing that they would always ask is what happened to this person? Mm -hmm. And then the investigator kind of fills them in. Okay, so the last time she was seen is around 9, 30, 10 o'clock last night. She was in her shorts and tennis shoes and at, at her mom's house. And then, and she's supposed to be in, at work at 3.30 in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning. So she, you know, they heard her leave the, the house about 3 o'clock in the morning. And then we, we didn't find her till 3.30 that afternoon. So now he's got kind of a window between nine o'clock the night before and three o'clock in the afternoon. And then he can corroborate everything that he, he, he knows it's, it's an investigation. You don't just drop off a body and say, figure it out, doc. You mm -hmm. know, it's the totality of the entire circumstance. But exactly. And, but during the hearings, this is a little bit off topic, but during the hearings, both Davis and Baker testified that you look at it blind with no other information. Well, you, you got to go through there, but, but, but they will ask, I mean, that you look at it blind. Sure. But then, then if you say, okay, so this, this girl supposedly was murdered sometime between say seven o'clock in the evening over here, because the mother of the victim is, I would call believable. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there's a conspiracy theory out there of a bunch of cops murdering Stacy Stikes, and her mother's in on it, I would call BS on that. Correct. No, any mother anywhere that would be involved in some point. But anyway, I'm sure there is, but I don't know. I and agree. So somewhere you got to go off of, you know, okay, mom says I saw her seven to eight thirty somewhere, whatever. You kind of got to go off of that. And then she, and then her body was found. So somewhere in there. Now, if he gets in there and he starts, he starts, uh, you know, doing the autopsy and dissecting organs and stuff. And then, then they say, wait a minute, these organs have way more decomp in them than what would happen in the last. And that's something that the doctor would see. He goes in there and he's like, all right, I'm expecting to see this, but that's not what I'm seeing. That's when they can change everything and go, hold on. Something well, ain't job. Actually, in reality, uh, because I found this and I saw this with the Larry Swearingen case, sometimes you're going to have non-traditional findings 
like histologically yeah. that are puzzling and not consistent with the known facts. And they don't use histological findings to, to gauge post-mortem window. You can't yeah, because there's not, they're not set. They're not used. And there's no, uh, there's no timeline data that can be used to interpret what you find. And they yeah. tried to do that with Larry Swearingen to say she had been dead after she was killed after he was arrested based on the histological findings. But the original autopsy findings were consistent with the window of two weeks given by the medical examiner. Yeah. And it was two weeks between the time she disappeared and the time her body was found. And that which case was that? That was Larry Swearing and Melissa Trotter in yeah. uh, Montgomery County. Well, you can't, you, you might find well, histological findings that aren't consistent. Well, and but the they don't use histological findings for the most part to gauge the postmortem window because they don't have enough data on those findings to be able to do so reliably. The most they can say is, but the histological findings suggest a shorter window yeah. or a longer window. And of course, they're using that as an excuse to, well, now the, now the, the medical examiner has come forward and recanted his entire testimony and that's not true at all right correct and um the lividity lividity is good to determine body position and whether it was consistent during the entire postmortem interval but it's not a good measure of the postmortem inter postmortem interval in and of itself and i remember and I, I don't know if i've discussed this with you before but i remember some time ago on one of the, the documentaries that they said, and they had a crime scene video of when Blakely and them were out there doing the scene. And there was a clip where they were moving Stacy's head. Mm -hmm. And look right there, look at that. She's not in, in a break in fear because her head is moving. Her head is moving. Yeah. And and it was right after that they were stopping the presses. Hold on, wait a minute. We've got a new, a new theory going, and all this kind of stuff. And and it was right after that, I went to another autopsy of an 18 year old girl, female, same, almost body style, everything as Stacy. And 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 I had a conversation with that pathologist, and I said, "Man, have you been keeping up with this Reed case?" And he's like, "Yeah, I've been kind of looking." He said, they said that, that, that there's something to do with the rigor. And this girl that we were working, you know, doing at this time had nothing to do with Stacy Stikes or anything like that. It was just similar, everything about the She had been deceased about the same amount of time, all that kind of stuff. And he actually showed this girl was in rigor and he was able to move her head. He goes, mm -hmm. surely that's, that's pathologist 101. There's not hardly anything holding your head. Be, you can move. Yeah. You can because, move. Well, because it, it also, it starts in the small muscles in the face, but that's where it starts to, to dissipate first. Yeah. So the but small he, muscles in the head and the face and the neck are going to be the first to start to go out of rigor when the limbs are still in full rigor. And I believe didn't uh, Norma Farley testify that the video, uh, some parts of the video show rigor more than they claim there was and i know they misrepresented the the way rigor works yeah but I, it was just a conversation with another pathologist just mm -hmm. like man really they're not stopping this whole yeah. case based on that and they're you know they're advocating and they're showing what helps their position but sometimes when it's in the media and when it's a quote unquote documentary or a quote unquote news magazine show uh, sometimes they're misrepresenting what they're showing the public and what they're telling the public right. and they're not There's saying it could mean this or it could mean that they're saying this is what it means 
yeah. there are two audiences, right? That the uh, defense and the Innocence Project are 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 uh, uh, two audiences that they have. One is obviously to get a legal um, hearing um, and delay the uh, um, execution, and the other is uh, the general public. It doesn't have to be as convincing because if you just throw out, you know, uh, enough about rigor mortis and and this proves this, this proves that. Well, then the general public is is behind you, and you've advanced your anti death penalty cause a little bit, and you make some money, and you get more supporters. So you know, the, it, it, only only half of the audience is in the courtroom. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now let me uh, let me switch gears a little bit with everybody. Um, we've been joined by Alexander, um, who is uh, another commenter on Facebook and he's written some articles about the case. Um, welcome, Alexander. Do you want to introduce yourself? Baron, I'm based in London, England. Uh, I've been a true crime buff since I was a uh, teen. And um, the thing I've noticed about this case, is, as with many other cases on both sides of the Atlantic, is that the evidence presented in the courtroom and the evidence, so-called evidence presented by their campaigners is just ridiculous. I mean, the more, I mean, this case is really open and shut. Um, how how Fidel was ever put in the frame is, is beyond me because the crime scene, if you look at the, the, the crime scene photographs, which I found in the Facebook group, which I put on the internet archive, clearly she was murdered at the scene uh, and uh, well, she was murdered in the truck and dumped. And... Fennell, there was absolutely no way. So if it wasn't Fennell, who was it? <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, it's just, it's like the whole, it's really, it's really is an insult, this case, because right. this guy is the worst kind of predator, worst kind. All right. All right. Well, our topic today is David Fisher. So um, one of the questions I put on the outline with David Fisher, why does he do this? Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, Alexander. Why do you think David Fisher does what he does in so far as not only the Reed case, but just in general, his medical examiner vendettas and and uh, crusades? What what do you think? Well, I, I can only think it's uh, in general terms. Um, if we look back to this. As, as, as far back as Sacco Vincetti, you have people queuing up to provide false evidence for, for mostly capital cases. And, you know, I, it, it just, I, it just beggars belief. I, I, why they do it, I really don't know. Perhaps they've got some sort of grudge against the legal system. But um, there's so many of these cases. And the thing about, the thing about this case and other cases like this is that they're not even close. You know, they're, they're absolutely rock solid. So, I mean, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. So, uh, so they play semantic games that they would read case, of course. They play the race card. Uh, you know, perhaps in this case, uh, they want to get rid of the death penalty. Well, there were 11 people, elect 11 people executed in the United States last year. So it really shouldn't be such a big issue. Mm -hmm. But all these people, uh, there's... I don't know. It's, just, it's like, like it's a religion for them. Yeah. All right, Patrick, what, what are your thoughts on uh, why David Fisher does what he does? Yeah, thanks. I, I think uh, DJ uh, Kevin actually asked me, why, what do you think David is doing uh, when he's saying all these things? And I said, well, you know, it, the, the answer was in David's previous question or, or, or rant, that he had, he, he, everyone comes to him, he says, you know, it's 2020, it's uh, the local newspapers, he is involved with everybody, he knows everybody, he lives there or, or nearby. Um, so he uh, does consider himself, you know, uh, Budinsky and um, he is on a crusade. I think it's a good, you know, uh, uh, term to use. Um, that uh, has given him probably uh, a lot more um, notoriety than if he were to say that he knew that Rodney um, 
Rodney uh, is the guilty one. So, I mean, and he can, he can, you know, spend a week kind of putting together whatever kind of crazy scenario that doesn't pass the Occam's razor test by a uh, light year. And he has someplace like uh, um, uh, Kevin Stu, who, you know, I give him credit. He's, he, he certainly didn't cut me off. I, I could have spoken with him for another hour. Um, and he was very, he, he invited me back on uh, if and when they talk about this again. Uh, but then again, if you look at what the four or five times that he, that they, David Fisher has been on his show, it's basically a David Fisher show. And mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's nothing much more, you know, uh, with due respect to Kevin than nodding in agreement as, uh, as he goes off on a tangent. So, um, you know, I mean, I, 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 I have a very hard time believing that uh, Fisher and other people who, who are combative about this case on Reed's part uh, on Twitter or Facebook or what have you, I really have a hard time believing that they believe Reed is innocent. But I do believe a lot of them are anti-death penalty. David, by the way, says that he's not, he's pro-death penalty. I was mm -hmm. saying um, this past Monday that I'm kind of anti-death penalty at this point in time, not because uh, I don't believe that people should be punished harshly for the crime, but I, I think I think of Carol Stites and going through this for 20 years. If, if Rodney was not convicted uh, uh, to the death penalty, then this might be just uh, uh, something that you can forget about. But I think it must be tough for the, for the people. So, um, but I, so I, I think that, you know, I, I think attention from the Innocence Project up until, as you were saying uh, recently, they're, they're probably kind of avoiding him. I think that has driven him a lot and all the other um, uh, press uh, opportunities, I think, are what, um, what's, what's, what's driving him. So, all right. I kind of disagree. I think if the death penalty is gone, life in prison would be next. I, yeah, I um, do agree with that, too. It's so, a slippery slope. But um, that's a topic for another day. Uh, Kyle, what do you think? What What's your opinion as far as why David Fisher does what he does? Yeah, I mean, I think I generally kind of agree. I think it's probably just, it's almost a way for just attention. Um, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't seem to be interested in the truth. He doesn't seem to have, you know, a strong passion for, you know, the Stites family. As we talked before we, you know, started, I was particularly offended by the way he just really, you know, slanders Stacy and the Stites family. So I don't think he has some sort of, you know, pure, you know, justice motive. I think, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but I think it's probably just, again, like others have mentioned, it is just a way to get attention and something that sort of makes him feel special and stand out because he gets attention from local media or from the Innocence Project. You know, it's just really a way it's, you know, it, it gives a reason for people to call and ask him to talk about something and get, get his name in print or, you know, on the air, if you will. All right. And Becca, you're next. Oh boy. <clears throat> First, I'm not a licensed a psychologist, psychiatrist, anything like that, but I do believe somewhere along the way, David Fisher has had some major trauma in his life that makes him seek attention because everything that he brings about is to support his narrative. And like the other people here on this recording with us today have pointed out, it gets him attention. And he's looking for a way to gain popularity for himself to continue doing what he's doing and playing detective. And that's the thing. You don't get to play detective. We're not five. It's not cops and robbers. Um, you actually need to be trained in things to look for in an investigation. And he hasn't had the proper training, but wants to receive the accolades of reporting and it's a way to support his own narrative to foster his sense of rights, his um, sense of belonging, his sense of worth. And that comes from something that was traumatic that happened to him, no matter what it was, that he's not facing. That's my personal theory. But 
it's just to get attention and it's just to drive home what he believes to be true. All right. And finally, Tim. I agree with everybody. <laughs> One hundred. And it, you know, it makes me think of, okay, so the National Enquirer is a magazine that, I don't know, they could just make anything up and put it in there and thousands upon thousands of people will read it and believe it and take it to the bank. And it's got to be true because it was in the Enquirer. You know, I, I, it's kind of like th those things. I think David Fisher is anti-police and pro-conspiracy theorist. I think it doesn't matter who it was or how it was or whatever. He jumped on that bandwagon and, and he probably heard it at first. Reed murdered Stacy Stikes. And then right after that, he probably heard the same rumor I heard when out back in the day. Well, you know, they were dating. And then he just, oh, yeah, yeah, they were dating. Yeah, yeah. And next thing you know, his conspiracy gene came out in, in him mm -hmm. and it just snowballed from there. And at this point, even if he thinks Reed is guilty, there's no way he would ever come forward and say, hey, you know what? I might have been wrong. Yeah, he's invested in the narrative. That's the, and, you know, there's a ton of people. And that's what I was going to say earlier. Who thinks, I'm going to put this out there right now. I predict that after this is all done, said and done and over with and stuff like that, I think that the Dr. Phil show is going to come out and they are going to recant everything and they're going to have a whole new series on how they were wrong. Oh, that would be okay. great. About I, I don't think that's going to happen because Phil McGraw is as narcissistic as they come and he's yep. never going to admit he's wrong. What oh, he'll no. do is he'll have a tribute episode if Rodney Reed is ever executed. I'm sure right. would like to come in and say, let's show you how we got this wrong and this what that we were lied to and we were, con you know, I think he might turn it on the Innocence Project and say, hey, they didn't tell us this stuff. No, because I think he's on their payroll, and I think he's uh, he's adopted their their mission and their agenda. But Tim, you made an interesting comment. Uh, personally, I believe, and I it's my speculation only. I don't have any proof, but I believe once Reed was arrested, his family and friends were going in every restaurant every store every place that they could and they were saying well you know rodney and stacy were dating yeah but i don't think that came into effect i mean he was arrested and stuff but i don't think the uh, the whole dating conspiracy came out until the trial he was arrested and i I, I believe his mother tried to start floating that at the uh bond hearing oh is that when it came in first came in yeah, because I think once they found out there was DNA, they had to find an explanation. Uh, and so the rumors that, that are before, being reported, right? the rumors that were reported by Ron Haas and, and Jose Coronado or Andrew Cardenas, I think all those things came about after Reed's arrest. Yeah, yeah, because nobody said anything. Mm -hmm. Wow, right. Stacy lay there and it, was, it turned into a cold case. Yeah. Not one person mentioned the word Rodney Reed, black guy named Rodney, any of that, because it was worth fifty thousand dollars if they would have. Mm -hmm. Well, Correct. and that goes that goes back because one, right, Lisa, he had run this play before when he was um, arrested and accused in Wichita Falls. He ran the same play and it had been successful, right? He was Correct. He was ultimately acquitted because he convinced the jury he had a relationship. And again, it goes back to, you know, Fisher's silly accusation that Stacy's mom told him that she knew Stacy was pregnant with Reed's baby. Well, I could imagine that Mrs. Stites would want to find justice and would have immediately gone to the police and said, hey, you might also look at this other person who Stacy is having a relationship with. I mean... Correct. It's just, it's silly. And I mean, it, to go back to his crazy point of this, some kind of conspiracy to frame Reed, I think people need to be reminded he was not arrested for what a year later. So 
they did a pretty bad job of trying to frame him if it took a year. And if he hadn't again done the same thing he did to Stacy, he never would have been considered a suspect. The only reason he was even considered is because, again, he tried to abduct and rape another woman who fortunately was able to get away from him. Correct. And well, Linda and I, is a hero, whether she feels like it or not. Is she is a hero. And one thing that, that everybody knows, but I have seen Reed's mom and his brother, Roderick, on TV saying everybody knew that Stacy and Rodney were dating. Everybody knew it. Everybody in the whole neighborhood knew it. Those two have yet to get on the stand and testify that they knew Stacy was absolutely. They've she, they've said in interviews that they knew Stacy, that they met Stacy, that <clears throat> Stacy was at their house, and yet not once have either one of them testified on Reed's behalf. Right. Well, and if again, if everybody would, if everybody knew it, like somebody mentioned, somebody would have gone to the police for no other reason than to try to get the reward money. And Reed and his mom would have been smart enough to go to the police and say, hey, I want to let you know, I know, Stacy, we were having an affair. Here's my alibi. I didn't do it. Because again, Reed's already been in this situation. Mm -hmm. He was acquitted. So they're immediately going to go to the, oh, he was scared as a black man. You know, he would have gotten railroaded, which my answer would be, well, absolutely not. Because again, he's already been through the system and he was acquitted. So he would have every reason to believe he would be acquitted again, especially if he had an alibi. So it would only make sense if he would have gone to the police immediately. Said, hey, I know her. We were having an affair. I was at my brother's house when she was murdered. I did not do it please check my DNA and I don't want to get arrested again. Correct. And you know, there's a, makes any sense. There's a recorded call with David Campos and a woman who had mental issues, who believed that her son was having an affair with Stacy. And in that call, David Campos is saying, who is your son? Because we have this unknown DNA and that would be the boyfriend's motive. So even if somebody had said Reed's name, they would have looked at that as Jimmy's motive, not as accus accusatory toward Reed. And I just want to go on record yet again, based on the experiences of Lucy and Caroline with Rodney Reed, being his girlfriend does not exempt one from exactly. a violent sexual assault. Uh, very well said. So that, being his girlfriend, he still could have killed her. Exactly. Um, I think and Alexander anything, has pointed out, and he's correct. Reed's, um, Reed and his family and attorneys have slandered Linda, Vivian, even Angela to a degree. And you're right, Alexander. And also, he pled guilty to assaulting Connie even though he was acquitted of rape in yeah, the Wichita Falls was case. Go. Fisher oh, was yeah. saying uh, there's no DNA in that, in that uh, case, but Connie was dating him and it wasn't, there wasn't a mystery as far as the DNA is concerned. No, there was DNA. And when there was DNA, that's when Reed said, or there was not DNA per se, there was serology. Right. And when they were taking his blood to check the serology, he said, I had sex with her. She wanted it. This that is the was girl after denying knowing her. This is the Wichita Falls girl? Correct. Yeah. And, and I've, I've spoken with a former classmate of Reed's in Wichita Falls who says that the Linda Schluter when he said, don't I get a hug? She said he used to use that in, in school at Wichita Falls. Really? And that would usually lead to an inappropriate advance toward a girl and, and or an unwanted if, advance. If you'll, if you'll look at that case in Wichita Falls and, and the 12-year-old case here, they're really, really similar. Mm -hmm. Girls at home, somebody breaks the, the back glass of the, the back door or something like that 
comes in, attacks. And I want to say that during the trial, now that, that for some reason, and I, I understand uh, the justice system, but for some reason, they did not try him in Wichita Falls for four years after this happened. I believe there was a combination. He was out on bail. And so there was a combination of the state and the defense, both seeking continuances. Yeah. Um, re Fisher says it was entirely the state, but that's wrong because even though he was out on bail, they still have a speedy trial. Yeah, that's that. And, and the, the, the uh, consistency between that case and, and the one here with the 12 year old mm -hmm. and, and people don't realize how we came into knowledge of the 12 year old. And Connie and identif Connie identified Reed. She went to school with him. She knew him. Yeah. The, the, the one in Wichita Falls. Yeah. But, uh, but the 12 now, no, I Angela could not identify him. He, pushed her face into a pillow well so the um uh or something along now now that was the uh ex-wife or ex-girlfriend that he beat up and pushed her face in the pillow the pillow had blood on it made it you know you could see I her face i think that was caroline caroline yeah okay or carolyn so the 12 year old is asleep yeah on her couch Ever somebody breaks the glass of the back door, comes in, has a mask on, large black guy, attacks her, rapes her, sodomizes her, everything else, and and bit her in the face and stuff like that. And I've sent you that picture before, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the uh, uh, the investigator, you said his name, that came to my house from uh, from Levy. the innocence. Yeah. The Okay, so when when he and I were speaking, I, I asked him, I said, just tell me this. What do you think about the 12 year old? And the first thing he said is, do you know uh, James Slaughter? And I know exactly where he was going with that, because James Slaughter was listed as a suspect in that. And I said, of course, I know James Slaughter. I went to high school with him. I played high school football stuff with him. And he got three life sentences for raping and beating women up and bastard up. And that's exactly where he did. He belonged in prison. And I said, and let me tell you exactly why you're even saying James Slaughter's name is because at the time, James Slaughter was doing the same kind of stuff around Bastrop. He was dealing drugs. And when these young little white girls would go out to that side of Bastrop and he'd pick them up and, well, he'd sell them crack. Well, he'd also beat them up and rape them and stuff, too. Mm -hmm. So he was doing that at that time. And when they asked the 12 year old do you know james slaughter she goes well yeah i think i do know that guy but uh they said could you could could this have been him and she said yeah this could have been james slaughter the right. guy, and 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 he it fits his mo so that's how they got a search warrant to go get the dna from james slaughter mm -hmm. because she signed a uh, she signed a statement saying i think it was james slaughter mm -hmm. well of course the dna did not match and it went cold until we entered Reed's DNA into the CODA system to see if he matched up with Stites. When he did match up with Stites, he also matched up with three other unsolved rapes in the Bastrop area. Mm -hmm. The 12 year old being one of them. Right. That's where stuff like that. But the, uh, uh, the conspiracy theorist, including David Fisher, I would love for David Fisher to explain the 12 year old situation the best there, his because, explanation is there is no dna he contacted dps and dps can't prove that they sent dna to elizabeth johnson and therefore there is no dna that is his i did for it explanation for it there's no dna Again. They're, they're just making that up correct yeah it just Correct. fits his narrative of what he is pushing to put out there. The one thing that I have that I try to explain to people when they ask me about this case is 
reads words and actions match up. He always claims after the fact, oh, you know, we were having an affair that nobody knew about, but it's always after he's been caught. And in the beginning, it's no, I didn't do that. And it's been the same throughout all of his troubles. And I don't know why people want to discount that because to me, that tells me everything I need to know. Mm -hmm. It's the same pattern of behavior. You see the consistency there, but they want to play the racial card. And, And I'm from Texas, lived there all my life. For all the way from Amarillo down to Corpus Christi. So I got a good taste of Texas, but it's not about a racial thing. It is absolutely 1000% the science and the DNA behind it. And it all points to read and everything else is just used as a distraction because there are people who don't support the death penalty and I get it. But unfortunately, that was what was on the books at the time. And that is what was decided upon. And just because he doesn't want to face the consequences of his own actions doesn't mean we should have to sit through however many appeals it's been because he can't face what he did. Yeah, and, and, and I think part of that, too, is I go back to there's no evidence, there's no objective evidence that they were having this wonderful long affair. Everything from, well, they should have found his fingerprints all over the vehicle. If they're meeting all of the time and regularly hanging out and doing stuff together, his fingerprints should be all over the car. That would be a sign that, okay, well, maybe he has been in here several times. And two, nothing of Stacy's he has not a note not a phone number not you know a piece of clothing nothing that says hey I know this person because usually when people are having a prolonged affair there will be some evidence again it might be a note a handwritten note on a piece of paper about a meeting time it might be a hey I you accidentally left your sweatshirt in my car you know there would be some evidence that Mm -hmm. they knew each other and were having a prolonged affair no one can have an affair like that and not leave some kind of physical evidence. Correct. Point. And, and I'm sorry, and, when, when, uh, when Reed uh, has been interviewed either by Dr. Phil or there is a woman uh, who did a long interview with her, uh, with him uh, over the, over the years, I think um, he, when he, when the woman asked him, you know, what can you tell us about Stacy? Yeah, exactly. Um, it was pathetic. I mean, it Uh was like he was in third grade and he got, you know, uh, uh, his hand in the cookie jar. He didn't, he only, he, he, he said something about her knee or, you know, her, her, she, she, she had a back brace, you know, I mean, things that Mm -hmm. everybody knows and things that he would have known if he had abducted her and raped her. So what's her, who was her favorite artist? What was her favorite song? What was her favorite author? You know, what what was her favorite radio station? What was her favorite color? Anything. Becca, I have a question. How did she feel about Michael Jackson? Oh, we loved Michael Jackson. Oh, like, okay. Darn we it. had so much fun. But that's music. That's it's, you know, that was something that was a part of our life. Now, she loved Taco Bell. I can tell you that much uh. because we spent an entire spring break eating pretty much every meal at a Taco Bell. Mm-hmm. And it was like we had so much fun. And you're right about not knowing enough personal details. Like he doesn't have enough personal details enough to know Stacy. Also his mom doesn't either, because I do believe I saw on a documentary where Reed's mother referred to that blonde girl, Stacy. Yeah. She's mm-hmm. not blonde. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, um, and I think they called she's her- brunette. Like, that was Iris just- Lindley that called her Stephanie. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And it was like, y'all don't even have any information that is noteworthy, that is actually true and relevant. Stacey did listen to a lot of country as well, but Mm -hmm. that was, that was her thing. George Strait, Garth Brooks. Um, But like all teenagers, we listened to a variety of things. Kiss FM was our favorite radio station growing up, you know, in high school. And we always went to the beach. We hung out at the beach 
all the time because that's what you did when you lived in Corpus Christi. You know, we went to the beach. Right. So it, you know. And Reed can't tell us exactly when they met. He says October or November of 1995, but that's a very broad window. That's 61 days. Exactly. Um, and a, uh, interestingly <laughs> enough, if they met in November, then her cousin Calvin could not have seen them at the Dairy Queen in Bastrop because they didn't even hadn't even met yet. Right. Exactly. In October when he claims he saw. Him. Well, and that's the theme of a lot of these, right, Lisa? They they can make broad general statements but they rarely can hold up to any kind of scrutiny i mean i'd i bet he couldn't tell you stacy's middle name or her birthday mm -hmm. well he would probably have that in the court records although he's probably not been bothered right i bet he wouldn't know it off the top of his head he yeah. wouldn't be able to say oh yeah it was you know yeah and, exactly and that's another mo of fisher he speaks in these generalities like um it's not on the outline i sent y'all sorry i thought of it afterwards but um, he speaks in these generalities. He says the Harris County DA's office had him work an arson case, but he doesn't say when, and he doesn't say, he right. doesn't give any information yep. specific that you could use to corroborate his claim that he worked an arson case for the Harris County DA's office. And <laughs> as I said, before we went, went on recording, the only case his name appears in in Lexus legal opinions is in the case where Sandra Reed was sued by her neighbor for ruination of her property that caused damage to his property. And the things that were said about David Fisher in that case, his role is not a flattering one. And of course, he's got a whole backstory about that case. Um, that unfortunately, you know, Sandra Reed is the victim of a mass conspiracy in the civil law system in Bastrop County. But, um, you know, yeah. what's on record on that case about him is not flattering. <laughs> Can I mention and another uh, false statement that he made? Because um, when I was talking to him last Monday, he said, uh, he, you know, he made a big deal about Jimmy closing out the bank account. Jimmy closed mm -hmm. out the bank account. Jimmy, yeah. he, he, he tells him when, you know, he drove back home and he, he wasn't looking for Stacy. He, 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 he closed his bank account. I go, yeah, but they did see bank checks or his bank checks there. I, I would do that too. And he's like, no, 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 no. And he went so far as to say it was illegal what he did because it was a joint account. Right. Well, and I went yeah. back and I found that it is not a joint account because I went through state's exhibits. Mm -hmm. States Exhibit 110C here is Jimmy L. Fennell Jr. That's the check that was found. Correct. Rolling Oaks, apartment 502. It was not Jimmy and Stacy. And I kind of thought that in the back of my mind, but I didn't bring that up because, again, I wasn't ready to get in a knockdown drag out fight right. with him. But it just goes to show you that I was discounting this this abhorrent behavior and because DJ Stu wanted to and, 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 and Fisher want to say that he would he killed his wife his fiance and was getting out of town with all his what two thousand right. dollars worth of money but he did yeah and, and and i think i think what he really came away with was around eight hundred dollars because right. if he had checks out they would hold the money for those checks and all this in like i don't even understand the craziness about the stealing the wedding dress i mean right. the the it's just insane. It's like, yeah, I don't even understand. This doesn't even have anything to I'm, do with the case. It's just silliness. I'm going to say what I told Kevin Stu in a um, in a in a comment on his Facebook page after one of that allegation by Fisher on another show. If that bridal shop owner is so petty that she's going to yeah. call twenty dollars owed on the dress. She's going to complain that Jimmy Finnell stole it. She is a petty bitch. But I think really, I don't think that ever happened. I don't think he ever talked yeah. to the woman. I don't I think so. I would think either the family offered to pay the $20 or the woman said, 
it's only twenty dollars here have it it's the least i can do i, I think I you're right up, about that i brought that up with them thinking that i would shame them but do, do, if you if you listen to it they started beating me up uh -huh. I mean, they, they yeah. were saying, well, if I gave you $20, $20 and you didn't give it back, that's stealing. I, no, if you, if, 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 if you gave me $20 and I died, uh, let's, 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 let's wipe the slate, slate clean. Yeah. Yeah. It was absurd. I, I just, I, I think that if the bridal shop owner was really that petty over, because initially when Fisher starts telling the story, it sounds Ooh. like. The bride, the bridal shop hadn't been paid anything ever on the dress. Right. Well, and at the end and of the day, what does it dollars. have to do with anything? It's it's right. completely and unrelated to the case. I want to but show you where Kevin Stew is coming from. When I provided him with that receipt showing the balance due was nineteen dollars and change. Yeah. His response was, "You don't even know that that was for Stacy's wedding dress. That could have been for another dress." Like what <laughs> fucking other dress is Stacy going to be buying at a bridal shop? Exactly. Other than her wedding dress. Really? Well, it could have been. On. It could have been a a matron or a a bridesmaid's dress. It could have been her mom's dress. Well, and all this, it, all moving is, the goalposts. Yeah. Smoking, all that is. They're mm -hmm. trying to get you to talk about the dress, so you'll quit talking about the steam, and that's all right. Over exactly yeah exactly it's it's if we, if we could talk about her um knee brace and maybe you'll forget about the saliva on her neck and her breast and stuff like that mm -hmm. and yeah that's big... exactly right they throw out a hundred little things to try to distract so people spend time talking about that instead of the case yeah another lie that keep on uh, saying filibuster filibuster you did and that was excellent that was true um, another lie that he told, uh, that David Fisher told was that Curtis Davis and Jimmy Fennell were high school buddies. Curtis oh. Davis was born in 1962. Jimmy Fennell was born in 73, maybe 74. <laughs> if Curtis Davis was held back that much <laughs> in high school, he would have been old enough to just drop out by the time Fennell got in high school. Yeah, but. Curtis, Curtis was a stand-up guy. I'm gonna tell you. No, and if, I I agree. If, but he didn't if, go to high school with Jimmy Finnell, and that's what David Fisher claimed. Because David Fisher, extraordinary investigator that he is, doesn't even know that Curtis Davis was born in 1962. He believes since Jimmy and Curtis were friends, they must have been born the same time and gone to the same schools. So speaking of investigators and stuff like that, and I know it's probably not even remotely on topic and stuff, but has, has anybody seen the, uh, it's called web exclusive. There is a, it's a, a young dark headed girl. She is at death row interviewing Rodney through the glass. Mm. In 20, and, and I know I've talked about this with you before, Lisa, but, uh, so they have taken that video and sent to these four world renowned uh, doctors and study yeah, people, body language people, body language mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Guys, they dissect this word for word. Yeah. And I, the Wicklander Zelensky school of interview and interrogation. I was, uh, you know, a uh, forensic interviewer, all that kind of stuff. And, and it's really, really interesting stuff you've ever it, got a chance to it is but i have watched it my problem with it is that they are presuming what reed is saying is the truth they have not done any additional investigation to determine that reed is lying about everything now well, while they do say he's lying here and his body language is <laughs> deceitful there they are not uh, they didn't dig deeply enough to know yeah. the if facts you, if of anybody, the case. If anybody here is interested, go to about 24 to 26 minutes in and <laughs> listen to Reed. He sounds like Johnny Cochran on, on, on the stand. He knows all about the Brady law. He knows about tagging evidence. And, you know, he is reading. He, he sounds like a lawyer. 
And then she goes, okay, well, that's fine. But can you tell me where you were when Stacy was murdered? And yeah. he shifts and his, his forehead crinkles up. He says, <laughs> he says the word work yeah. about six times in four seconds. He's like, I think I was getting ready to go to work because I, I had to work. I had to go to work and, and, and I had to go. And, and, and I definitely wasn't with her. And then brother, if y'all will go and watch that and check it out and tell me with common sense, say, I think that guy's lying. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that's that underscores another good point, too. And again, it's with a lot of these cases. They never have an alibi. And that doesn't mean that in 100 percent of the time. You know, yes, there may be situations where people have trouble producing an alibi, but it's always amazing that, you know, Reed, you know, if he's innocent, it'd be pretty easy for somebody to be able to clearly say and document where he was, you know, during that time period where she was murdered. But it's this case and others, they can never have a very clear alibi that holds up to any scrutiny. Well, and there's if you just think about it, like, uh, when was your first child born? I could tell you what every little teeny tiny detail of the room would look like. Mm-hmm. I could tell you when it was, how it was, when I got there, how I got there, all that kind of stuff. And I would think that the night Stacy was murdered was a pretty significant day yeah. in the life of Rodney Reed. Right. And yeah. he can't, I'm like, you're sitting on death row for, at the time, 18 years or so, and you can't even remember the night that you're talking about? Like, I could have told you, and and I don't know why, but he might as well tell the truth. I was walking the streets selling crack to whoever would pull up next exactly. to me. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Oh, and there was, an, there was a hilarious um, decree. This is one of the examples that I call Fisher saying things just to say them. And he doesn't care if they're correct or true or right or not. And he will double down and insist that he is correct, no matter what the odds or costs. Reed didn't smoke crack. Crack is burned. Well, there's a statement from Chris Aldridge that says they used to drive around in the truck smoking crack. But Reed never smoked crack. He did cocaine. Well, and, to, and to Fisher, the distinction is crack is burned. Yeah, I don't know that much about cr- uh, crack or cocaine, but I know crack is cocaine. And I told yeah. him that. And, I, and he said, no, it's not. Yeah, it is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And one of the preferred ways to ingest it is by lighting it on fire and sucking the fumes into your lungs and blowing mm-hmm. out a of smoke. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And what I, what I do remember is uh, um, Aldridge saying that Stacy used to go and smoke crack with them. She would be the first one to pull out the pipe. And that's uh-huh. why. Absolutely I, not. I, I sorry. sorry. Over, that's... Over, over, over again, that now every little young white girl that would go over to that side of town and buy crack and smoke it with them is now Stacy. Yeah. There's. there's I have no doubt that Aldridge and Reed took several young white girls out there and smoked crack with them all the time. But mm-hmm. Stacy was one of them. And it wasn't yeah. in Jimmy's truck. No. Yeah, definitely. Or her system. Yeah, it wasn't Absolutely. in her system. It wasn't in her hair. But now they say, well, the hair test <laughs> isn't sensitive enough to get someone who's a casual user. Well, if you're the first one to grab that pipe and smoke it with those idiots, you're not uh, a fucking casual <laughs> user, right? Exactly. exactly. You're not a casual no. l- user. And well, Becca and- is there's a there's an underage. Uh, apparently, Stacy had an underage possession of alcohol. Were you available? Were you around for that, or are you aware of that? I I'm aware of the situation, but I was not present for okay. that situation. But that that in that particular instance with her she did a 180 like mm-hmm. i know enough about stacy to know that the crazy theories that they have about she was dating him first of all why is she going to date a man 20 years older than she is that's ridiculous second of all she was building a life with Fennell and you know weeks 
away from her wedding and she would not have done anything to jeopardize that. So with that being in her past, I know that would not be in her path at that time because that Mm -hmm. wasn't who she was. I mean, she would never, she didn't judge her friends if they did certain things or partook of certain, you know, activities, but her and I never did. That was like where we drew our line in the sand. We were like, nope, that's, right. that's not us. That's not who we are. Um, so if there was th- that, in- that incident with the underage alcohol, it definitely wasn't something that was a planned event or something that Mm -hmm. happened all the time with her. It was a isolated thing. She learned from it. She moved on. And I know her relationship with her mother was something that was very important to her and family. And she wouldn't do anything like that to jeopardize. She wouldn't have been right, you know, riding around smoking, whatever with Reed, it just would not have been a thing. And and let's put, I think the MIP needs to be put in context. I mean, I'm not excusing it, but those (laughs) things are as common as country music in small Mm -hmm. town, Texas towns. I mean, exactly. This is not selling. This isn't finding five bags of cocaine in your trunk. I mean, there's, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of kids pulled over every Friday and Saturday night in Texas. And yeah, most of the cops say, okay, just get on out of here, pour it out and yeah. go on. Occasionally kids get MIPs, but it's not, you know, it's not like she and, was arrested for armed robbery. And it doesn't mean she was using drugs or smoking exactly. marijuana or smoking exactly. crack. Exactly. Right. It, means it doesn't exactly. mean she, she was, was having an affair in possession of alcohol yep. at some exactly. point. But like you, like you said, Becca, I think she, she got caught. She got that MIP and she said, oh, fuck, I don't want to do that again. Absolutely. And so she, she turned herself around and stopped doing what she was doing. Absolutely. And it doesn't even mean you have an alcohol problem. It means, you know, you, mm-hmm. that, you know, there, believe me, there's plenty of people that drive drunk every night and never get caught or a lot of kids that have booze that never get caught. It's just like, I, doesn't mean she had an alcohol problem either. I grew up in New Orleans and I am in a generation where the drinking age in Louisiana was 18 when I was growing up. When I was 16, my friend and I used to go out drinking and there was a little, there was a little pizzeria where we could get beer. And there were a couple of other places where we could get beer. We were 16, but we looked older and they didn't ask us for identification. We then started going to a restaurant bar because the drinks were really cheap and they were really good. And one night we're sitting at the table, we're putting on fake English accents and talking to men we have no business talking to. And guess who walks into that restaurant because it's a family restaurant where my parents went? My Your mother parents? and father. And I made eye contact with my mother. I looked at my friend. I said, we need to leave. We got up. We walked out. My mother had the grace to not kill me right then and there because there were too (laughs) many witnesses. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I went home. I took my friend home. I went home and then I waited and my mother came home and she said, you know, you were wrong. If you were caught by the alcohol bureau in that bar, that family would lose their restaurant because you're 16, not Mm -hmm. 18. And after that, we went to the pizzeria because beer is not as big a deal. Absolutely. And she's what she was a she was still a teen so we stopped going to restaurants and drinking in bars and drinking liquor but we still went out and drank beer illegally for two more years until we turned 18 but just saying i mean you know that's a teenage girl and if you can get away with it you're going to do it absolutely Um, and i don't think we even had a drinking problem but we also talked to men we had no business talking to (laughs) and the narcotics expert or official here can correct me if I'm wrong, but if they really wanted to prove whether or not Stacy had ever smoked crack or whatever, toenails and fingernails go back nine months to a year. So if that was certainly something that played into the case, they would have looked into that. 
And it was yeah. just an unfounded thing for someone they, to say to distract. They actually yeah, sent Stacy's hair. Hair. I think the hair. The hair. And it was luckily. thirty-two. Uh, there was thirty-two centimeters of hair. And that that goes back, you know. And that a, a yeah, because I think lot. it's like a centimeter a month, so it's thirty-two months. Exactly. But again, the well, Innocence Project has argued that the hair tests need to be redone because the hair test that was used isn't sensitive enough, enough to get a casual user. I don't find that to be credible because a lot of drug labs, that's what they're trying to get is the casual users. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and again, it's, it's not really germane to the case. I right. mean, it has really nothing to do with whether or not she was, you know, attacked raped and killed by Rodney Reed. Again, it's just a distraction. Right. It would corroborate Chris Aldridge's statement. That's what their that's what their angle is. Right. Well, and, I mean Tim can and speak. And that to this. would corroborate the alleged relationship. Right. That's what the angle is. Well, I mean Tim's the expert, but it's my understanding is, you know, crack is not a drug that, you know, you just kind of casually use. You know, it's it's pretty addictive. And so I think most folks that are into that stuff are pretty into it. They're not just, oh, every few months I do a little crack just for fun. Yeah, no. Right. It's no, it's no casual crack is. Exactly. It affect her work. People yes. at work would know. Her husband would know. Yeah, her that's would not know. something. Yeah, exactly. With the, par yeah. the paraphernalia required, that's not something reasonably you could hire. And my guess is, I mean, I'm not an expert, but my guess is HEB probably did, you know, quite a bit of drug testing as well. Correct. Well, and her pre-employment drug test was clean. No signs of any kind of illicit drugs. What I know that when they do crack, they it's not just like, oh, I went over and smoked a little crack, but then now I'm going off to work and stuff. No, that that stays in your system and, and makes you almost incoherent for, you know, 12 hours. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, that, that reminds me of, you know, when whenever they were saying, I wanted to ask anybody else who would know um is anybody ever said anything about what stacy was doing the day before like did she did she go to work that day and she was at work? work yeah and she, she got home work. and she she came because uh, that's that's monday evening monday afternoon she came home to carol's she changed her clothes and had a little nap she ate lunch she hung out with carol and jennifer she sang songs with jennifer and read to jennifer and then she uh, waited for Jimmy. Jimmy came home and waited for him to come back from baseball. And then Carol saw Stacy and Jimmy going upstairs. So, so when when is it that she snuck off for a couple hours and met Rodney Reed? At right, the that was like well, supposedly that Sunday was night, right? Before she went to work. Yeah, that was before she went to work. But her routine, she didn't leave at twelve o'clock or one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And she left 25 to 30 minutes before she had to be at work and she was never late. So there's no time. That's a 25 to 30 minute drive. There's still, no time for her to meet up and hang out and have sex with Rodney Reed. I still think the um, Rodney has told y'all where the, the murder occurred. The Bastrop In, state park, the Bastrop state park. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I totally, that is totally my speculative theory. He's told you, he's told you. And I, and, and ev with everything I've pieced together and stuff through the, my investigative experience, I can almost walk you through it 100% and drive you through it. I, I still lean more towards the train was going by and she stopped at Fayette street. And if he was on his way back, like Chris Aldridge said, we went to my mama's house on Magnolia Street and stayed in the car and drank and smoked. And then Rodney mm -hmm. walked home. Rodney was always walking down the, the railroad tracks. If you're on those railroad tracks headed southbound and, you, and you're approaching Chestnut Street, where the railroad tracks, that Chestnut is the main drag going right through the, the town. Mm -hmm. and, and as you're the railroad tracks run behind his mother's house about one block from Chestnut and Fayette. Yeah. And if you're walking down the railroad tracks and here comes a train, which they used to come through early in the morning like that. Cause I remember driving a patrol car at three o'clock in the morning, 
not mm -hmm. being able to have to go up and over a bridge if there was a train stop there. And yeah. if he's road or down the railroad tracks and here comes a train, all he has to do is step about 20 yards to the left and he's walking down Fayette Street directly behind him. If he's walking down Fayette Street directly behind him about 200 yards is where the where Stacy's truck was found. Mm -hmm. And now walking towards Fayette and Chestnut, if she stopped right there, that's exactly where she would go if she's going on her way to from mm -hmm. Giddings to if she stopped right there, it's a small little intersection, dark. And yeah, who was little girl in this truck right here? I'm gonna and he punched her in the in the side of the in head. The head. Yeah, yep. And there's a train. Uh, and right that a, goes straight up the hill to the state park. That truck, from what I could see, from what I could tell, did not have automatic locks. If she forgot to lock the doors. And I yeah. think that that's as simple as that. She forgot to lock the doors that morning. Well, I agree different. with both of you on that. And Greg and I have talked a lot about that. And he's actually driven the whole route. Mm -hmm. And he that was his summation of what happened. She got stopped there because of the train. And Rodney probably saw her driving to work picking up those extra shifts to pay for a wedding that she's having an affair with another man behind her fiance's back. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. It, it, First time Rodney Reed ever laid eyes on her is when she was stopped at that intersection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was a, it was a opportunistic time. Nobody knows. Yep. Nobody knows she is out here. This train is going by and he just, he snapped and he, and he, punched her in the head and and she went unconscious because he's a golden gloves boxer 300 mm -hmm. pounder in the side of the head and he pushed her straight over face down in that in that floorboard and he he got in that car and made a u-turn and drove straight up the hill into that state park area right there and then she may have came too and tried to fight him off a little bit I and told personally and i believe the reason stacy was killed was because she fought not yep. only fought, but I think she told him, this is your ass because my boyfriend or my fiance yep. is a cop. Absolutely. Thousand percent correct. And I think and she the, heard him and I hope to God she heard him good. Well, and I tell you, as soon as once once the deed was done there, now he's in panic mode. Mm -hmm. And probably drove down 21 looking for a, a, a side street 21. Uh, east going towards page and the first intersection you come to is 1441 mm -hmm. if you take a look right there he's probably familiar with that there's a state or the the boy scout camp and the, and the lcra park out there and there's mm -hmm. some back you know dirt roads death roads and that's exactly and he went i don't know what maybe half mile down 1441 before he came to blue bonnet and he made that loop down in there and that was that was dark enough and wooded enough for him to stop and pick her up and take her and put her off in the trees he hastily tried to put her pants and everything back up and try to cover it up but then he went straight down 95 and the first thing you come into town is the, the high school and parked that car right there and kept mm -hmm. walking his same route that he was just walking down Fayette Street to his mom's yep. house exactly exactly and that's, that's believable right there yeah I, I see that happen there's no and no crazy story oh that there's no way that happened but josie's the, like how does he overtake a truck well if the train is coming she can't move forward and it's a standard it isn't easy to move when you're stopped he may not have even seen him until that door was open. she probably didn't yeah it, it probably i i've always agree, i've always believed that he you know opened the door and smacked her and, and she sure, was out yeah sure enough, autopsy video she's got a large contusion on the left side of her head consistent mm -hmm. punched in the head mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and that would explain the truck stopping because her foot comes off the clutch you know it stalled yeah it would have stalled, it stalled. Yeah, exactly. exactly yeah it wouldn't exactly. have kept going it wouldn't yeah that's exactly right it wouldn't have kept going if she was incapacitated mm -hmm. and yeah. the seat was set at a um, it was set far enough back from the steering wheel for someone Rodney's height. Correct. And he was Neither. taller 
than neither, Fennell and Stacy. Yeah, neither Jimmy or Stacy could have driven the truck with the seat in that position. Exactly. And if if Jimmy's planting the truck to try to frame somebody, he's not going to think to put the seat back. And I I I, I know this is going to sound horrible, but in my experience, the people I see with the seat back at a at such a steep angle are African American men. Yes. Cuz I don't see people. I don't see Caucasian men, I don't see Latino men, I don't see Caucasian or Latino women. I don't even see African American women driving with the the seat back at a steep angle. I only see African American men. And Reed being tall, he may have needed to put it back at that angle because the truck is a relatively small one. Well, and at that point, I believe he's sitting on top of Stacy. I still- no, I think he pulled her out of the seatbelt <laughs> and put her over in the passenger seat. I think so. he, but he they- didn't touch the seatbelt. He didn't adjust the seatbelt. In his haste. Or open it. Her out. He reached in there, scooted that seat back, climbed in on top of her, and just turned that car around and drove up, up right there. And then he pulled her out of that seatbelt. Because he had to get out of that section to, to, for, to make sure nobody saw him hit her and jump in that car with her. Absolutely. Yeah, but I think yeah. he could have pulled her out from under the seatbelt because they were able to pull uh, Karen Blakely out. Yeah. yeah. Pretty so, easily. I mean, belt is still is from still both there. driver he and passenger sides. And he was in panic mode. Yeah. Yeah. That, that being said, while I'm saying it, the other side, the other side, Kyle is asking what road that was blue bonnet drive off of 1441 it makes a makes a loop oh thank you yeah so um that being said i think that's kind of somewhat believable that's probably what happened you know some something along those lines mm-hmm. but fisher wants us to believe that she went home after having sex with rodney and, and not taking a shower, hanging out with her mom, all that kind of stuff. And then Jimmy Fennell got mad at her and found out about it. And he drowned her or choked her or whatever in, in the house. And then he, then he calls uh, Curtis Davis or whoever over there to help. And somehow, some way, these guys get her dressed in her HEB uniform. Because that's what she was found in, correct? Correct. With correct. Reed's DNA on the pants. Oh, okay, and and then not only were was these two guys that were have to be in somewhat panic mode and stuff like that, but they're cops, and this is what they say: the cop framed him. They were so detailed in dressing her dead body that they put her knee brace on, and they even took toilet tissue and rolled it up and stuffed it down the side of her knee brace. So it wouldn't rub because that's what she used to do. Mm-hmm. Like, Correct. Oh, we got to rest and we got to be so detailed that we put toilet tissue in her knee brace. So yeah. they'll find when they find and, her body. And they put one shoe on and left the other shoe off and put it in the truck. And, and, well, and, yeah. and the on earring, top. they had one, they put the earring back mm-hmm. in her hair yeah. and put the other earring down in the truck. Now, I know a lot of smart, smart, smart cops and stuff like that, but none of them could have came up with that. Mm-hmm. Well, and, yeah. and even too, even the Occam's razor is, you know, Jimmy being a cop is going to know that in every 99.9% of the situations, the primary suspect is always going to be the boyfriend or the husband or the fiance. And he knows that she's having an affair with this Rodney Reed fellow, but he's just going to keep that quiet. He's just going to say, oh, yeah, I, you know, he's not going to attempt to point the finger at her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just it defies common sense 
because that would be the best way for him to get out of the hot you know, seat is to say, hey, this she's having Fish, an affair with this guy. It might be him. Fisher's theory is Wardlow and everybody else is planning on framing Rodney anyway from the beginning. Why do they not talk to him? But they wait an entire year. On to April do 23rd it. or April sense. 24th. And some, they, some they of- only they only bring his name in when there's another attack on a 19 year old girl in the same area. And I want to address uh, something that Fisher has said about the checking account being a joint account. Yeah. Um, Of course, Patrick, you established it was not because it was only only Fennell's name was on it. But whether it would be frozen in the event of Stacy's death, if it's a joint account, depends on if it was a joint and account. If it's an or account, it would not be frozen. I'm on an or account with one of my sisters. If something happens to her, I still have access. If something happens to me, she still has access. The only time access would be frozen and it would become part of the estate would be if it was an and account. And I can confirm that I work at a bank. So <laughs> you're exactly Very right. good. Thank you, Becca. It's, a, it's absurd that thinking that uh, Jimmy was going to get far with the what we decide eight hundred dollars or so eight, i think probably. it was around eight hundred dollars i think yeah. the balance was uh, you know the balance was over a thousand twelve hundred or fifteen hundred something along those lines but if he had checks out they're going to hold that money to to cover those checks if Absolutely. he had uh if he had draws from the account they would hold the money to cover those accounts. Yeah, and I think, frankly, what happened is I think he closed the account and he opened up a new account in the same bank. Right. But they didn't ask for those records. Well, and, and in the same sense, uh, the, the truck comes into, you know, I, I'll, I'll depict the, the truck version of it where as soon as they were done processing the truck, they don't, they don't normally just keep it. So they called and I think he had already, his father had already made arrangements with the dealership. He's like, mm-hmm. I don't want that, nor would mm-hmm. I. I don't yeah. want to see that. Absolutely not. And they, they towed it straight to the dealership and traded it in and got him. a. And that's another false statement by Fisher. Fisher claims mm-hmm. that because the title was signed on the 24th of April, that DPS returned the truck on the 24th of April. You do not keep the title with the vehicle ever in arkansas and in louisiana there's a statement on the letter you get from whoever issues your title that says do not keep this with your vehicle keep this in a safe place yeah and there's a good reason because if your vehicle's stolen you don't want the title in the vehicle for them to convert the vehicle to themselves right or someone else but they have made it about he traded that truck in or sold it as soon as he got it and i was like that truck was sold before he got it back yeah yeah it it would be creepy if he it it would be creepy if he kept the truck yeah absolutely absolutely i I was gonna say the same thing right because isn't there that old you know there's that old um you know thing that killers like to keep you know they like to keep souvenirs they like to revisit the crime To me, the fact that he sold it immediately and never wanted to see it again speaks volumes about his innocence as opposed to, hey, I got off on, I'm a violent, horrible person. I want to relive this every day. Just the fact that he sold it just makes sense that he was innocent. And that's another false impression or false statements that that Fisher makes about it. He says, um, you know, Fennel testified he sold it to Jimmy, uh, to Gold Chevrolet. Well, yeah, that's true. And he could have made arrangements even before he got the truck back from DPS to get another vehicle. Absolutely. That's between him and Gold. But yeah. he says his father took it, but his father yeah. couldn't take it. But if his father had the signed title, oh, yes, he could. Sure, he could. It doesn't I matter. That all know. worked before they even got it back. And they, and they mm-hmm. may not have known that they were going to get the truck back. Right. Um, no, they, they, I think they would have known because I don't think DPS has the facilities or the, uh, and in Texas where you can shoot a repo man when he's trying to repo your truck, (laughs) or at least you could at the time. Um, I think that the, that the 
the um, views Texans lawmakers have of private personal property would have made it extremely difficult for DPS to have even attempted to keep that vehicle inordinately or indefinitely until there was an arrest in the case. Yeah. Well, and if all the evidence in the card wasn't pointing to Fennell, there would be no reason for them to keep it. They processed everything. Right. You can't tell me that they didn't process Correct. it with a fine tooth comb. And they you know, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit further. If Fisher is such a great investigator, he could have tracked that truck down if he wanted to, oh, because yeah. he has all the That's information true. about it, that he could have gone to the DPS or motor vehicles or whoever, and he could have gotten exactly where that truck went from Gold's and, and he could have found it. I covered a case in Nebraska and I believe Iowa, where two years after the woman disappeared, they tracked her truck down and found blood in her truck that linked her murder to the truck and linked the truck to the person who killed her. If I had Absolutely, his- it would have been public <laughs> record. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, an, an investigator for Reed, for Jimmy Brown, for, for Lydia Clay Jackson, Dwayne Olney, he could have tracked that truck down if he wanted to. They didn't want to track it down. They wanted to complain that it wasn't right. available for them to look at. Right. Fisher just and- goes on and on about there not being a document that the truck was signed in. It was, you know, a video has been taken of the DPS. Uh, exactly. Forensics. Uh, and then it was checked out. And it, it's just all, you know, and then what I told him on Monday and is you're not due every, every shred of information. Correct. Yeah. And, well, you know, whether there's a document signing it in and signing out doesn't change the fact that there were reports that were entered at trial. They may not be considered public record. They may not be available for us to order from DPS. Um, they probably are part of the trial record. And there was testimony at the trial of the people who process the truck and the results of their investigation into the truck. So all that. of that, that proves there was an examination of the truck. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and there's a video. The uh, presence or absence of a sign-in, sign-out sheet by DPS, which is based on his alleged conversation with somebody at DPS. May or may not be true. Which probably is not true. Um, and Dude, as, as entertaining and as wonderful as this has been, we're getting toward the end of our uh, recording window. I cannot believe that we have that went by so fast <laughs> <laughs> because I'm watching because I've been cut off before. Um, so I think we're going to have to table this. Um, thank you everyone for joining me. And uh, we will definitely have to put this together again. Another time, because I'm sure David Fisher will give us a wealth of information to cover down the road and thank Patrick, you for again all, thank you for I all think your you work did a wonderful job yeah, thank thank you for the uh, case notes I'm, I'm i've been reading this as we've been talking and that's a great compilation did you send this to dj um kevin no i'm i will not send this to dj kevin okay okay, okay. um this i'm gonna is send for you something my that... purposes for the purposes of my guests okay. if he wants to appear but see, the problem is, is that DJ Kevin will want a document right. to back up everything I say about this when some of this stuff is not based on documents. Right. It's based on my knowledge of the chronology of the case and yeah. my conversations with people who know what they're talking about, including Deborah's, uh, Stacy's mother, her sisters, her friends, and people who actually knew her and cared about her. Yep. So, yep. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for all your work. Um, when Stacy left Corpus, I kind of lost track of her and didn't learn about what happened to her until a good bit of time later. And just the chronology of everything that you've put together has given me 
a sense of peace knowing that there is somebody out there advocating for Stacy. Thank you. I still have her picture hanging in my in my bathroom from when that spring break that we spent the uh -huh. entire spring break together and Taco Bell and all of our friends and just having fun and being teenagers and it that's that's where her memory lives for me and to know that you're advocating for some peace for her mom and her sisters and Greg and everyone in her life that loved her and knew her and and of course Jimmy too he's suffered greatly because of this um I just hope that it brings some peace to the family to know that there is someone standing up for Stacy. So thank you. Thank you. And I, I just can't let such obvious false information stand unchallenged. And that's basically, that's why I do what I do. I want to challenge the false information and put accurate information out there based on a lot of sources and a lot of resources, not just hearsay and speculation that I'm doing. When I'm speculating, I'll say it. But when I'm talking from the record or from the facts established at trial, those are unassailable. And I challenge them to refute them with more oh. than just, I say, or mm -hmm. I think, or I believe. Well, that's so important. We have an epidemic of misinformation and disinformation. So again, I echo, I really appreciate all the work you do to at least keep discussions around facts so the truth can get out there and so people don't continue to continue to be misled thank you all right everybody so thank you so much alexander thank you for joining us all the way from london uh i can't imagine what are you missing sleep no no it's only midnight here oh I it's only you, midnight i don't usually go to bed till <laughs> two or three a.m so <laughs> so but thank you so much for joining us uh tim Thank you again, Becca. It's been Thank wonderful. You. And we will do this again. Uh, Kyle and I are going to talk about the status of Reed's case in two weeks because there's a lot of material and I need next weekend to digest all of it. So we'll, uh, you. we'll be looking, looking forward to it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I will talk to you all later. Thank take you. care. All right. Take bye care. Bye. Thanks. All right, Kyle, if you want to stay. All right, sure. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do the outro and then um, thank you again. Your first official co host. And you did a wonderful job. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. And um, I know a couple of other people have expressed an interest, and please email me at the Based in Fact or reach out to me on Facebook or on the Based in Fact page um, because I, I don't want to do this by myself. So but I am Kyle, you're here. in there. You're in you want do you wanna do you want to give it a shot, Becca? Not even necessarily read case. Sure. All right. Absolutely. All right. Um, if you have a case other than Reed that you're interested in, shoot me a note. I'll do the research. I'll provide you with the case notes and then you and I will talk about it. Okay, cool. Absolutely. And that's your audition. Okay, absolutely. All right, great. All right, Kyle, let me get my outro done before Zoom cuts us off. Thank you for listening to Based in Fact, a true crime podcast with Lisa O'Brien and Kyle. If you like the show and want to know more, you can find us on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter at O'Brien L. Ann. While researching today's show, I realized that the volume of material was too much to get through in a single Saturday and Sunday. So Kyle and I will be back on February 20th, 2022 to talk about the recent developments in Reed's case, including closing arguments, Reed's proposed findings of fact, and those entered by Judge Langley, his 11th writ and the flaws in those claims. Until then, have a great two weeks and stay safe. Good night.